that twabble, that twabble, Talane, Shayla, Trina, that twabble, that twabble. All right, y'all, let's fix this camera. I noticed on the video, uh oh, my camera be. We getting like half my head. Okay, I'm gonna have to do this adjustment later, make sure it's straight for tomorrow. All right, y'all. Happy Wednesday, happy Wednesday. I hope everybody enjoyed their day of rest yesterday. If you, in fact, did rest. I know sometimes we, uh, some of you may not have been able to, as we're just learning how to keep the rest days on their appropriate days. Where is my pen? Why well, tell you my kids? I need my pen. Oh, Father, forgive me. Here's my pen. I'm, I was about to blame my kids, and I'm looking over it. Overlooking it, shall I say. But anyway, beautiful people. Look, y'all, I mentioned it the other day. I noticed a pattern going on on the Sabbath days. Good day, Natasha. Good day. Uh, a pattern um, when we're doing the Sabbath days as they rotate. Hey, Shelby, you at work? Okay. Have a good day. Have a good day. It's recorded. Look, so. I noticed this pattern. I'm going to just mention it real quick before we get started because we start Exodus today, right? So I noticed this pattern by actually writing down, peace and blessings, Aliyah, that the Sabbaths, as we're keeping them, as they seem to rotate, listen, because I've been tracking like the moon cycles and stuff and where it's set, you know, just seasons and everything, just, you know, just being diligent, tracking. So I understand the book of Enoch actually getting out doing it, but I began to notice a pattern come through. Salutations, Nikki, salutations, right? So I'm going to show you. I know this is going to look backwards to you a little bit, but here, this is my new notebook. And um, although this is the, this is December 2020, so what I did was I, uh, with my new book, I took my information from my book we just I just finished using because it's filled up in the 2020, and I transferred the last couple weeks of December over here, and I added my January dates, right? Simply so I can, as I look at the big calendar, it's here as well, and I can go back and kind of look at my data, right? So listen, listen, right? Okay, so up here you see, so the Sabbath, this cycle we're in, um, hold on, wait, no. Okay, so in November, when we had the new moon, the new moon in November, it fell on a Sunday, right? So remember, so that moon cycle, the, the Sabbath fell on Sundays, but I also began to notice for that entire moon cycle from, it was new, from the period where it was new, we got full and it went out again. That's one moon cycle or one, month, or one true month cycle. That's how we know a month. The the months follow the moon. That's where they got the word moon from, if you didn't know. And it actually used to be, they used to use, use the word moon, like M-O-O-N-T-H. That's where they got month from. It used to be moon. They took out an O. So now it's month. But it, the month, the actual months, as Yahuwah has created them to, is actually following the moon. And I didn't realize that until I began tracking it. And it, I, I couldn't see, as long as I had it in my head and not actually writing it down, I could not see the pattern emerging, right? Blew my mind. Called my mama talking to her, was it day before yesterday? Now I was so excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to do a separate video on this because I'm not going to be able to fit this in a morning video. But I wanted to, I'm trying to talk real fast. I wanted to at least bring it up so you guys can see, right? Because <clears throat> I'm in a habit of testing everything. I know sometimes we do things because it's always the way it's been done, but if nobody ever questions, well, why are we doing, okay, why has this been this the way it's been done? Not that we're questioning the ways of Yah, but I want to make sure that I'm truly following the ways of Yah, right? Because we realize as we're waking up to who we are, who Yah truly is, that sometimes we've inherited some lies as well, right? You know, so I just want to go back and double check stuff. You know, okay, if it lines up, it lines up, boom, that was good information. I'll keep that. But I'm not in the habit of throwing out the baby with the bath water. And I hope y'all learn not to do that, right? So what I learned that's good that I've tested so far, I'll keep. But things that need to be adjusted, I'll make the adjustments as I learn how to make the adjustments. So I said all that to say to show y'all what pattern is emerging, right? Okay, so 
with following the Sabbath, actually resting on these days, granted it's throughout the week, because you got to remember, okay, the Sabbath is is Saturday or Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Okay, if that's keep following that, but if you want to get a little bit deeper, actually begin to look at the seasons and how it follows the month and all that stuff, right? So look at this. So when we celebrate the Sabbath, um, according to the actual moon cycle, a full moon cycle a month, you know, um, we realize that the the Sabbath count starts over with every new moon cycle every new month there'd be no way we could keep the correct count from the beginning of time since it was instituted thousands of years ago there would be no way for the current generations to be able to keep up with that everything Yahuwah who does is simple and we should be able to replicate it no matter which generate which generation we are in right and so that's why the moon changes every month it is it's, it's it's a course correction for us. So what I began to notice, I said all that, just give you just a little bit of background. But what I began to notice is that when you have the, wait, it don't go back to November, but I wrote November here. So December actually starts here. Well, it starts here, then it came around the count, right? Okay. So um, December starts, well, this was, okay. So this, no, I'm sorry. That was the full moon. I'm sorry. Okay. So, but anyway, you will see. And I'll show you when we get over here to January because I kind of want to hit a little bit. Okay. So, on every Sabbath, I realize that the moon is at a certain quarter. Now, if you look up the moon phases, they have uh, different phases of the moon. And every time you look outside, depending on what day of the month it is, this should be the moon phase of the sun. If you check that out and actually go outside when the, the uh, moon is out, when it's visible, you can actually check and verify, yes, this is correct. This is correct. So that's what I began to do, right? And as I began to write it down, I actually began to put on the on this, I figure I just tracked the Sabbath days just to see because I had an inkling. I'm like, Father, there has to be a way in nature to prove or to show us that this is the Sabbath day. And since I was already tracking the sun and the moon and the stars, I figured, let me look for patterns there. So I would only write it on the Sabbath days, right? What the cycle would be, on the moon cycle on the Sabbath days. And as I began to pay attention a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, wait, oh, oh, snap, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute, could we actually see when the Sabbath is? In the heavens, and sure enough, we can. You have moon, you have uh, moon phases, and in those moon phases, phases are quarters. They're quarters. You have the full moon, which is like the beginning of the new month. Then you have the first quarter, and the first, the the new moon is black, right? It's completely black. That's what the Book of Enoch tells us. When she turns black, she's starting over. It's brand new. But we can't call out the new moon until we see the new moon or recognize the new moon. Think about Feast of Trumpets. You cannot blow the trumpet until you sight the first sliver of the moon. Then boom, Feast of Trumpets is the first day of the seventh month. Burr, 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 burr. Blow the trumpets, right? Blow the trumpets in Zion. Every you know, during the seventh month of the year, hearing trumpets blow, it was funny this year. Well, last year, this last past feast season, because I was watching a couple of video videos, and I think I mentioned it. People was freaking out. Like, Jesus is coming back. I'm hearing horns and horns. I'm the out and out. They're blowing all day long. Anybody else hearing horns? I'm like, people. Okay, y'all may not know, but this is Feast of Trumpets. So y'all going to be hearing trumpets for quite a while. And because people have different days, I can guarantee you, you're going to hear them over the next week, possibly two weeks, because people have different days. They're in the same vicinity, but during this period, you will hear trumpets out of the blue, right? And I was super excited when I actually heard trumpets in my neighborhood. This was the first time I heard trumpets in my neighborhood this past Feast of Trumpets, right? So I was like, yes, it made my heart excited because I say somebody else close is keeping the laws of Yah, right? So, okay. So, but anyway, so we can go ahead and get started. I noticed that on the Sabbath, when it rotates, when the Sabbath, when you line up the Sabbaths and celebrate them on the same day that the new moon is. So this moon cycle, the new moon started on the Tuesday. So for this complete moon cycle every week on Tuesday, it's a Sabbath. And you know how we know, because when you look out there, the moon is at a very specific quarter every single time without fail. I went back and checked. I'm like, oh, snap. This is like really happening. I was like, oh my gosh, who else? Is anybody else saying this? Has anybody else noticed this? Clearly they may know they're just not using the terminology because they put it out there and they just called it the moon quarters. So the moon quarters are actually Sabbath days, you guys. 
I went back and I checked through a few months. I was like, wait a minute, I got to make sure this pattern flows all the way through. So I went back all like through like my 2020 year and just looking at it, I was like, oh, 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 this is good. This is good. Like, so even if you're not counting, if you understand the moon cycles about nature, you can see, okay, new moon first sliver or whatever with, with the beginning of the month. But when you see the moon, when it's half and it's light on the right side, we're at the beginning of the month and that's first quarter. When you see the full moon where she's completely bright, we're at the 15th day of the month, right? That's considered the second quarter, but they don't call it the second quarter. They call it the full moon. And then you can tell we've gone towards the end of the month. The moon is going to be half lit again, but this time she's going to be light on the left side. That's how you can know that the light is going out, right? And on these days, and then after this light on the left side, boom, it's the cycle starts over again. It's the new moon guys. So I hope you got that. If you didn't go back and rewind it after the video is over, if you want to get it and go actually out there and check. But like I said, I'm going to do a separate video on this and um, hopefully I'll be able to do something where I can show the screen so you can look and see this is what the full moon is. Everybody know what a full moon is, but this is the first quarter. You see that it's light on the right side. This is the third quarter. It's right on the left side, meaning she's getting smaller, right? Okay. So I hope that made sense, y'all. So when you see these quarters, know that we are at Sabbath days. We are at true Sabbath days. Okay. All right. So at least from my understanding as of today. Okay. So I'm super excited about that. But NC who? NC who? Okay. And I did it right here too in January. So I was showing you December and I came through when I did it here. And I looked ahead and I wrote it down on other papers. I said, like, oh, this is going to be great this month as I watch these things go by, right? Okay, so we will be coming up on the new moon, the next new moon cycle, because currently we are in the 10th month of uh, year, the lunation year 6007. So next two, I'm sorry, next Wednesday, the new moon changes and the Sabbath will rotate to Wednesday starting on the 13th of January, 2021. And it'll be, we'll be in month 11 of year 6007, the lunation year 6007, 6007. I know they tell us when 2021, but according to like earth time and all that stuff, it's, it's the lunation year is 6007. So when we get to Passover month between um, March, we will be back at um, year, the first month of Lunation year 6008. Okay, y'all. Shalom, shalom. Greetings, mother. Okay. All right, y'all. So let's get started today. I'm sorry. I know there was a long introduction, but I really wanted to share that with y'all so at least y'all can start looking with me, right? Okay. So today is day 42 of year three of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three-year consecutive day count, day 712. Do you have a question that pertains to the reading this morning, son? Somewhat. Not a question, but the video I sent you may help you with Okay, thank you. I'll look at it after this. Both All right. Watched it because okay, y'all. I can tell this going to help you with your Okay, I appreciate that, son. Okay, guys, and today we're reading Exodus 1, 2, and 3, and we're going to add in the the filling pieces that we need to add in over in um Legends of the Jews. So with this, we'll go back here using, hold on. I gotta adjust this. I'm going back to reading it off the computer, y'all. And I'm sorry, I know the video go go just a little bit long today. Not too long, but because I did this long introduction. Um Bible gateway. Okay. So forgive me for that, but if you have to go and you gotta go to work, please go to work. Do not steal company time. You know, you can stay here if you work for yourself or you make your own schedule, but you know, remember it's always recorded. Okay. Exodus 1. Okay. I'm sorry, y'all. All right. Shimmer. Yes, the shimmer. Thank you, Shayla. Thank you. I'm glad I looked over. All right, y'all. The shimmer, 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 shimmer. Uh, it's crazy. 
Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily, as Yahuwah, the God of our fathers, has promised us, and the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our God, he is one God, and you shall love Yahuwah, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and upon your gates. And Yahuwah commanded us to do all these statues to fear you who are God for our good always that he may preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before you who are our God as he has commanded us. All right, beautiful people. Oh, why did I close that? Oh, okay. Okay, boom. Okay. I'm sorry. I was again, I'm reading from the heart back for a while. And I almost lost what I'm supposed to be doing here. Okay. Okay. Exodus chapter one. These are the names of the son of, sons of Israel, that is Jacob. Remember, Israel, his name was Jacob. You would change his name to Israel, right? The sons of Israel. These are the names of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In time, Joseph and all his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a king, a new king, came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. Real quick note. In Jasher, I said we was going to go back to Jasher because Jasher fills in this place right here. There was a whole lot that had happened um, just right here. Um, Egypt was literally about to go to war with their cousins. Remember I mentioned that before? So they said, listen, when they found out that there was their cousins, like, mm, let us deal wisely with these people because if we get out there and we fight with them because, mind you, Israel had been fighting with Egypt. They'd been in the land. Joseph was alive. The blessing of Yah was still on everybody. So when Egypt needed help, Israel was already there in the land. And they was kind of like that backup military force for Egypt. So when they found out that they was about to go to war with their cousins, they said, mm, mm, Israel, why don't y'all sit out this time? We're going to take care of this. And like, you show, sure? you know, we're ready to roll for you. We're ready to go. Like, everybody ready. Let's do this. I say, yeah, no, we thought about this. You know, y'all go ahead and stay here. This is really not y'all fight for real. We're going to take care of this. So summing up, that's essentially what happened. But what the new uh, Pharaoh said, he said, let us deal wisely with this people. Because if we go out to war with our enemies, because they're their cousins, Zephyr and them, they might decide to join with them boys and then we're going to be utterly destroyed, right? So that's a quick backstory of what happened. They just gave us a couple little sentences here, but that's the huge backstory. But if you go to Jasher and read this, it'll fill all that in, but it also fills a lot of that in here in the Legends of the Jews. So I'm going to read it from the Legends of the Jews and on your own time out in today's um comment section and description i'll put the chapters in jasher where you can go and actually read that as well okay so i just wanted to say that real quick all right we must make a plan to keep them from growing even more if we don't and if war breaks out they will join with our enemies and fight against us then they will escape from our country so the egyptians made the israelites their slaves they appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread. And the more a 
alarm. The Egyptians came. Won't die. We multiplied. That was a blessing that Yahuwah had put upon his people and they weren't getting it yet. The more you oppress us, the more we multiply because it has been prophesied and it's going to happen that eventually we're going to overtake you and we're not going to die. The more of us you kill, the more we're going to reproduce. We're just going to keep multiplying keep multiplying. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Sifra and Pua. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If he is a girl, if it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared Yahuwah, they refused to obey the king's orders and they allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They're more vigorous and have their baby so quickly that we cannot get there in time. And just in case you didn't know, the Hebrew midwives were Hebrews themselves. They were. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna find proof of that. So Yahuwah was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared Yahuwah, he gave them families of their own. And one of these midwives is a very, 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 very well-known Hebrew. We're gonna find that out today who she was, right? Keep this in mind as we expand the story. And because the midwives feared Yahuwah, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all the people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Exodus chapter 2. About this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own. The princess named him Moses. For she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During this visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend, Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and he tried to kill Moses. And Moses fled from Pharaoh, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual, as usual to draw water and fill the trolls for their father's flocks. But some of the shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew the water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked, why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he? Their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come eat with us. 
Moses accepted the invitation and he later settled there with them. In time, Ruel gave Moses his daughter Zephora to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to Yahuwah. Yahuwah heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. They left all that detail out of the story. I never knew the mother nursed him. Yes, the mother, his own mother actually did nurse him. Yep, Moses' mom. All right, last chapter in Exodus for the day, y'all. Then we're going to go right over here and fill this in with some of the details. Moses and a burning bush. One day Moses was tending to the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of Yahuwah. There the angel of Yahuwah appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. The bush was engulfed in flames. It didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why is that bush burning up? I must go see it. All right, babe. Love you. Be safe. When Yahuwah saw Moses coming to take a closer look, he called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses. Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, you who are warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at you. And then Yahuwah told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to Yahuwah, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Yahuwah answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship Yahuwah at this very mountain. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And a lot of times we skip over this and we never even know that Yahuwah gives his name at but we understand the proper translation of it. Listen, Yahuwah replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yahuwah also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahuwah, right here it says Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now, let me pause right here real quick and go back and make a correction. Something that I learned in the actual Hebrew language, the W, like it's not Yahweh, it's Yahuwah. So the actually the W here, at this time, when they were translating this, there was no W. Remember that there was no W. It was actually a the it, it's it's a it was they you. I'm sorry. There was no U, so they used the V. So it's a double V. But the double V, it wasn't actually a V. It was a U, and the U made the O sound like O O like. Ooh, so this is actually Yahuwah. Remember, they got the E-H there, but there is no E in Hebrew either, right? So like Elijah, it's not actually Elijah. It's Aliyah, Aliyah, who? You know that, right? You changed your name. It's not Elijah, it's Aliyah, right? Some people say Yahoo, but it's Aliyah. So the name is actually pronounced Yahoo or Yahoo. Ooh, 
a uh, right yahuwah some people put it all together like i do yahuwah some people actually enunciate it yahuwah right you will hear it a couple different ways but y'all know we're speaking of him but i just wanted to bring that out just in case you did not know yeah, I am who I am. It's not you. No, that's Asher. What is it? I am who I am is not you who are Tiffany. That's if you read it closely, it's that's not what it's saying. I think I am who I am is a higher Asher, a higher. If I got that correct, I could be wrong. I know it's close, but that means I am who I am. Um, that I am who I am right there is not translated. Yahuwah. So you got to go back and read that again. I think you misread that. So I am who I am in Hebrew is actually a higher Asher, a higher. And you'll hear people referring to the Most High saying that. And people got a lot of poems about how you address the Most High. Um, and I get that. But if you understand, there are a lot of different variations of his name and they're all correct. So that's why I stopped doing. There was one time I was about to make fun of somebody who called the most high um, Yahweh, right? And as soon as I was about to say it out of my mouth, I don't know how to explain it to you other than like there was like an immediate check that came over me like don't you dare do that because you know people arguing about the name and stuff and i was about to crack a joke like i'm not being like malicious or anything but i was literally i was about to crack a joke on the way they pronounce it like i i don't like i said the best way i know how to explain that is the, i don't know there was like a, a supernatural spiritual restriction that immediately grabbed me and said don't you dare do that and i'm like and like for days, I was like almost in weeping, like, oh my gosh, father, I almost like did something that I shouldn't have did. I'm sorry. I was so I don't make fun of people who pronounce his name in different ways, right? I really don't do that. And that's just my personal experience. That's why I don't do it. Um, so okay. So all right, I'll go back here. I read 14 again and we'll keep going, y'all. Yahuwah replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Yahuwah also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. Yahuwah, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahuwah, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. He told me I have been watching closely and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from the oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, Yahuwah, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three days journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to Yahuwah, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptian, Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go and I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably upon you. They will give you gifts when you go so you will not leave empty handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. Okay, people. So let's go ahead and hop right over here to the legends of the Jews. All right, y'all. And this is actually... We're going to volume two, right? So volume two. Let's pass over. Yes. Okay. Oh, man. Okay. birth of Moses. Okay, I think we're about right here. Wait. Oh, okay. It's chapter four. It's actually in volume two. And if you have the same book, I have the bigger book. It's page 204. But if you have the smaller book, I'm not sure what page it is, but it's volume two, 
chapter four, and it's the section beginning with Moses. It says chapter four, Moses in Egypt. And the first subtitle under it is Moses in Egypt, the beginning of the Egyptian bondage. Okay. So what we're going to read today, we're not going to get to the point where we end it today in Exodus. And because we're going to be in Exodus and it's going to go through Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, we're just going to keep reading this through at the pace that we go daily. And we're going to eventually get to all those things. We're going to kind of super, we're going to, while we read through Exodus, we're going to blow right past all of the detail while we're reading Exodus, but after we're done reading Exodus, we're going to come back and we're going to fill in the detail. So the days are going to be straddled a little bit, but it's still, it's, we're getting more of the picture starting from Moses. So we're going to be talking about Moses for a couple of days and the midwives, and it's going to fill in those details. So when you read in Exodus, you will realize, remember how y'all hear me say the Bible, the canonized Bible is literally a summation of everything. It's not the full account of everything that happened. They literally from each scroll, they may have pulled one or two sentences from there, from out the bigger books, and they made a chapter and did it that way, right? Some of it, they have a little more detail, but a lot of times you'll see from different sections of different scrolls, it's just one sentence that's actually in the Bible. And it's still enough to lead you back to Yah. But if you want to have a deeper, a fuller understanding of what actually happened, which will actually increase your faith, I truly recommend that you get the Apocrypha, read the Apocrypha with Enoch, Jasher, Jubilees, and all the other ones, and get the Legends of the Jews, because this goes in much deeper than uh, Jasher and Apocrypha does, right? Okay, so now that that's it, let's start reading. What time are we at? All right, we are at 35 minutes. Okay. All right, remember, volume, volume 2, chapter 4, Moses in Egypt, um, and if you got this book, it's page 204. Okay. As soon as Jacob was dead, the eyes, listen to this. As soon as Jacob was dead, the Israelites' eyes were closed as well as their hearts. They began to feel the dominion of the stranger, although real bondage did not enslave them until some time later. While a single one of the sons of Jacob was alive, the Egyptians did not venture to approach the Israelites with evil intent. It was only when Levi, the last of them, had departed this life that their suffering commenced. A change in the relation of the Egyptians toward the Israelites had indeed been noticeable immediately after the death of Joseph. But when they did not throw off their mat, I'm sorry. But they did not throw off their mask completely until Levi was no more. Then the slavery of the Israelites supervened in good earnest. The first hostile act on the part of the Egyptians was to deprive the Israelites of their fields, their vineyards, and the gifts that Joseph had sent out to his brethren. Not content with these animosities, they sought to do them harm in other ways. The reason for the hatred of the Egyptians was envy and fear. The Israelites had increased to a miraculous degree. At the death of Jacob, the 70 persons he had brought down with him had grown to the number of 600,000 and their physical strength and heroism were extraordinary and therefore alarming to the Egyptians. Therefore, I'm sorry, there were many occasions at that time for the display, for the display of prowess. Now listen to this. Listen to this, and I want you to, as you're listening to this, think about our people, right? Think about our people and how how some it seemed like some of the supernatural things our people do, and really won't even have uh, the full power of y'all poured out upon us shit, right? We see it in, in small little glimpses. So listen, listen to this. So the uh, Egyptians knew how bad the Israelites were because Yahuwah stood with them. So that's why we got we got their wise with them. So listen. Not long after the death of Levi occurred, that of the Egyptian king Magron, who had been bred up by Joseph and therefore was not wholly without grateful recollection of what he and his family had accomplished for the welfare of Egypt. But his son and successor, Mahol, together with his whole court, knew not the sons of Jacob and their achievements, and they did not scruple to oppress the Hebrews. The final breach between them and the Egyptians took place during the wars waged by Magdal against Zepho, the grandson of Esau. 
In the course of it, the Israelites had saved the Egyptians from a crushing defeat, but instead of being grateful, they sought only the undoing of their benefactors for fear that the giant strength of the Hebrews might be turned against them. Remember I mentioned it was they was fighting, they was fighting against their cousins when they realized that hey, y'all sit this one out because what if they what if they turn against us? Aliyah, you're absolutely right. Sounds like our exit will be the same way. The counselors and elders of Egypt came to Pharaoh and spake unto him, saying, Behold, the children of Israel are greater and mightier than we. Thou hast seen their strong power, which they have inherited from their fathers. For few of them stood up against a people as many as the sand of the sea, and not one has fallen. Now, therefore, give us counsel what to do with them until we shall gradually destroy them from among us, lest they become too numerous in the land. For if they multiply and there falleth out any war, they will also join themselves with their great strength unto our enemies and fight against us, destroy us from the land and get them up out of the land. The king answered the elders, saying, this is the plan devised by me against Israel, which we will not depart. Behold, Pithom and Ramses are cities not fortified against battle. It behooves us to fortify them. Now go ye and act cunningly against the children of Israel and proclaim in Egypt and in Goshen, saying, All ye men of Egypt, Goshen and Pathros, the king has commanded us to build Pithom and Ramses and fortify them against battle. Those among you in Egypt, of the children of Israel and all of the inhabitants of the cities who are willing to build with us shall have their wages given to them daily at the king's order. Then go ye first and begin to build Pithom and Ramses and cause the king's proclamation to be made daily. And when some of the children of Israel come to build, do ye give them their wages daily. And after they shall have built with you for their daily wages, draw yourself away from them day by day and one by one in secret. Then you shall rise up and become their taskmasters and their officers. And you shall have them afterward to build without wages. Like they was plotting on them. Like we're telling them we're going to pay them, but we ain't really going to pay them. And this is how they were drawn in. Right. And they should refuse. And if they should refuse, then force them with all your might to build. If you do this, it will go well for us, and we shall cause our land to be fortified after this manner. And with the children of Israel, it will go ill, for if for they will decrease in number on account of the work, because you will prevent them from being with their wives. So they say, well, we keep them in here building, don't even let them go home. Because if they go home, they're going to sleep with their wives, and they're going to start reproducing. Listen. The elders, the counselors, and the whole of Egypt did according to the word of the king. For a month, the servants of Pharaoh built with Israel, and then they withdrew themselves gradually while the children of Israel continued to work, receiving their daily wages, for some men of Egypt were still carrying on the work with them. After a time, all the Egyptians had withdrawn, and they had turned to become the officers and the taskmasters of the Israelites. Then they refrained from giving them any pay. And when some of the Hebrews refused to work without wages, their taskmaster smote them and made them to return by force to labor with their brethren. And the children of Israel were greatly afraid of the Egyptians. And they came again and worked without pay, all except the tribe of Levi, who were not employed in the work with their brethren. The children of Levi knew that the proclamation of the king was made to deceive Israel. Therefore, they refrained from listening to it. And the Egyptians did not molest them later, since they had not been with their brethren at the beginning. And though the Egyptians embittered the lives of the other Israelites with servile labor, labor, they did not disturb the children of Levi. The Israelites called Mahol, the king of Egypt, Meror, bitterness, because in his days, the Egyptians embittered their lives with all manner of rigorous service. But Pharaoh did not rest satisfied with his proclamation and and the affliction it imposed upon the Israelites. He suspended a brick press from his own neck and and himself took part in the work at Pithom and Ramses. After this, whenever a Hebrew refused to come and help with the building, alleging that he was not fit for such hard service, the Egyptian would retort saying, 
Dost thou mean to make us believe that thou art more delicate than Pharaoh? The king, ur the king himself urged the Israelites on with gentle words, saying, My children, I beg you to do this work and erect these little buildings for me. I will give you great reward, therefore. By means of such artifices and wily words, the Egyptians succeeded in overmastering the Israelites. And once they, and once they had them in their power, they treated them with undisguised brutality. Women were forced to perform to perform men's work and men's, I'm sorry, and men women's work. The building of Pithom and Ramses turned out no turned out of no advantage to the Egyptians, for scarcely were the structures completed when they collapsed or they were swallowed by the earth. And the Hebrew workmen, besides having to suffer hardships during the erection, lost their lives by being precipitated from the enormous heights when the building fell in a heap. But the Egyptians were little concerned whether or not they, de they derived profit from the forced labor of the children of Israel. Their main object was to hinder their increase, and Pharaoh therefore issued an order that they were not to be permitted to sleep at their own homes, that so might that so they might be deprived of the opportunity of having intercourse with their wives. The officers executed the will of the king, telling the Hebrews that the reason was the loss of too much time going to and fro, which would prevent them from completing the required tale of bricks. Thus the Hebrew husbands were kept apart from their wives and were compelled to sleep on the ground away from their habitations. But Yahuwah spake, saying, Unto their father Abraham I gave a promise that I would make his children to be as numerous as the stars of heaven, and you contrive plans to prevent them from multiplying? We shall see whose word will stand, mine or yours. And it came to pass that the more the Egyptians afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad, and they continued to increase in spite of Pharaoh's command that those who did not complete the required tale of bricks were to be immured in the buildings between the layer of bricks. And great was the number of the Israelites that lost their lives this way. So they said, you ain't putting out what we need you to put out. We're going to put you in the building like a brick. So that's what they do. doing. they started putting men into the building structure and putting mortar over them. Many of their children were, besides, slaughtered as sacrifices to the idols of the Egyptians. For this reason, Yahuwah visited retribution upon the idols at the time of the going forth of the Israelites from Egypt. They had caused the death of Hebrew, Hebrew children, and in turn, they were shattered and crumbled into dust. <clears throat> so let me just say something here. Like we see especially in the church world, right? Now, I'm not saying that abortion is not wrong. It absolutely is wrong. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> not only, see, the church is crying out. It, I'm, I'm not going to say crying out against the wrong thing, but they're crying out against something that's wrong, which is abortion. And I agree with that. But what they're completely ignoring is all the lives of the people of Yahuwah's people that they have aborted in these streets, whether it's through gentrification or whether it's through uh, 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 forced abortions or forced surgeries that would keep us from multiplying or they're murdering us in the streets or in our home when we're playing video games with our children. They're doing all of this and they refuse to call attention to this or even acknowledge it. And it's because of the killing of his people and his children that this great wrath is coming upon this place. That's why I came upon Egypt. And I'm telling you people, pay attention. Y'all better pay attention. When now, in spite of all their tribulations, the children of Israel continued to multiply and spread abroad so that the land was full of them as with thick underbrush. Hold on. <clears throat> when now, in spite of all their tribulations, the children of Israel continued to multiply and spread abroad so that the land was full of them as with thick underbrush. For the women brought forth many children at birth. The Egyptians appeared before Pharaoh again and urged him to devise some other way of ridding the land of the Hebrews, seeing that they were increasing mightily, though they were made to toil in hard labor. Pharaoh could invent no new design, and he asked his counselors to give him their opinion on the thing. Then spake one of them, 
Job in the land of Uz, which is Aram Naharam, as follows. The plan which the king invented of putting a great burden of work upon the Israelites was good in its time, and it should be executed henceforth. Too, but to secure us against the fear that if a war should come to pass, they may overwhelm us by reason of their numbers and chase us forth out of the land. Let the king issue, decree, issue a decree that every male child of the Israelites shall be killed at his birth. Then we need not be afraid of them if we should be overtaken by war. Now let the king summon the Hebrew midwives that they come hither and let them command them in accordance with this plan. Job's advice found favor in the eyes of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They preferred, they preferred to have the midwives murder the innocents, for they feared the punishment of Yahuwah if they laid hands upon them themselves. Pharaoh said, listen to this. Yeah, I'm going to read that again. I'm going to read that again. Listen to what it said. They preferred to have the midwives. Now, remember, the midwives were Hebrew women themselves. So they said, let's use their own people to murder them. That way, if Yahuwah gets mad, wrath will come down on them because they were afraid to do it themselves. So they decided, let's devise a plan. Let's get them to murder their own. Y'all get that? Y'all see what's happening here? Let's get them to murder their own. That way the wrath of Yah falls on them because we don't want it to fall on us. Listen, pay attention and think about the current world we live in. Has it changed? Has it changed? It hasn't changed. Listen to this. They prefer to have the midwives murder the innocents for they fear the punishment of Yahuwah if they lay hands upon them themselves. Pharaoh cited the two midwives of the Hebrews before him, and they commanded them to slay all men children, but to save the daughters of the Hebrew women alive. For the Egyptians were as much interested in preserving the female children as in bringing about the death of the male children. They were very sensual. They were desirous of having as many women as possible at their service. However, the plan, even if it had been carried into execution, was not wise. For though a man may marry many wives, each woman can marry but one husband. Thus a diminished number of men and a corresponding increase in the number of women did not constitute so serious a menace to the continuance of the nation of the Israelites as, to, as the reverse case would have been. The two Hebrew midwives were Jacobed, the mother of Moses. Remember I told you one of these midwives was a very famous woman. We're going to find out who this was. It was Jochebed, Moses' mother. Two, the two Hebrew midwives were Jochebed, the mother of Moses, and Miriam, his sister. When they appeared before Pharaoh, Miriam exclaimed, Woe be to this man when Yahuwah visits retribution upon him for his evil deeds. The king would have killed her for these audacious words had not Jochebed allayed his wrath by saying, Why dost thou pay heed to her words? She is but a child and knows not what she speaks. Yet, although Miriam was but five years old at the time, she nevertheless accompanied her mother and helped her with the offices to the Hebrew women, giving food to the newborn babes while Jochebed washed and bathed them. Pharaoh's order ran as follows. At the birth of the child, if it be a man child, kill it. But if it be a female child, then you need not kill it, but you may save it alive. The midwives return. How are we to know whether the child is male or female? For the king has bidden us to kill them while it was being born. Pharaoh replied, if the child issues forth from the womb with its face foremost, it is a man child. For it looks to the earth whence man was taken. But if its feet appear first, it is a female, for it looks up towards the rib of the mother, and from the rib a woman was made. The king used all sorts of devices to render the midwives amenable to his wishes. He approached them with amorous proposals, which they both repelled, and then he threatened them with death by fire. But they said within themselves, <clears throat> our father Abraham open an end that he might feed the wayfarers though they were heathen and we should neglect the children nay kill them no we shall have a care to keep them alive thus they failed to execute what pharaoh had commanded 
Instead of murdering the babes, they supplied all their needs. If a mother had given birth to a child, to a child, I'm sorry. If a mother that had given birth to a child lacked food and drink, the midwives went well to do, went to well to do women and took up a collection that the infant might not suffer want. They still did more for the little ones. They made supplication to you who are praying. Thou knowest that we are not fulfilling the words of Pharaoh, but it is our aim to fulfill thy words. Oh, that it be thy will, our Lord, to let the children come into the world safe and sound, lest we fall under the suspicion that we tried to slay it and maim it in the attempt. You who are hearken to their prayer, and no child born under the ministrations of Sephara and Pua, or Yochabed and Miriam, as the midwives are also called, came into the world lame or blind or afflicted, afflicted or with any other blemish. Seeing that his command was ineffectual, he summoned the midwives a second time, and he called them to account for their disobedience. They replied, this nation is compared unto one animal and another. And in sooth, the Hebrews are like the animals. As little as the animals do, they need the, I'm sorry, as the little, I'm sorry, as little as the animals do, they need the office of midwives. These two God-fearing women were rewarded in many ways for their good deeds. Not only that Pharaoh did no harm to them, but they were made the ancestors of priests and Levites and kings and princes. Jochebed became the mother of the priest Aaron and the Levite Moses. And from Miriam's, Miriam's union with Caleb sprang the royal house of David. The hand of Yahuwah was visible in her married life. She contracted a grievous sickness. And though it was thought by all that she saw her death, I'm sorry, hold on. She contracted a grievous sickness and thought it was, and though it was thought by all that she saw her death would certainly overtake her, she recovered and Yahuwah restored her youth. Listen to this. And Yahuwah restored her youth and bestowed unusual beauty upon her so that renewed happiness awaited her husband who had been deprived of the pleasures of conjugal life during her long illness. Now that says a whole lot now. I'm telling you, the marriage union, Yahuwah sees that as something powerful, more powerful than you guys truly know at this moment. But some things I'm finding out, there might be a, there might be a, 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 a separate thing that needs to be done away from this because there is, I'm not getting into it, but I'm just saying, I'm understanding just a little bit quite of what the mystery of a husband and wife is, right? And why it's so special to y'all and why it's so powerful, right? Let me read this again. She contracted a grievous sickness and though it was thought by all that she saw her death would certainly overtake her, she recovered and Yahuwah restored her youth and bestowed unusual beauty upon her so that renewed happiness awaited her husband who had been deprived of the pleasures of conjugal life during her long illness. His unexpected joys were the reward of his piety and trust in Yahuwah. And another recompense was accorded to Miriam. She was privileged to bring forth Bezalel, the builder of the tabernacle, who was endowed with celestial wisdom. All right, y'all, we're moving here to this next section. And then... We won't have to stop. We'll have to stop it after this section. We'll pick it up, pick up the rest of it tomorrow. The three counselors. In the 130th year after Israel's going down to Egypt, Pharaoh dreamed that he was sitting upon his throne and he lifted up his eyes and beheld an old man before him with a balance in his hand. And he saw him taking all the elders, nobles, nobles and great men of Egypt, tying them together and laying them in one scale of the balance while he put a tender kid into the other. The kid bore down the pan which it lay until it hung lower than the other with the bound Egyptians. Pharaoh arose early in the morning and called together all his servants and his wise men to interpret his dream. And the men were greatly afraid on the account of this vision. 
Balaam, the son of Beor, then spake and said, This means nothing but that a great evil will spring up against Egypt, for a son will be born unto Israel who will destroy the whole of our land and its inhabitants, and he will spring forth the Israelites from Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, therefore, O king, take counsel as to this matter, that the hope of Israel be frustrated before this evil arise against Egypt. The king said unto Balaam, what shall we do unto Israel? We have tried several devices against this people, but we could not prevail over it. Now, let me hear thy opinion. At Balaam's instance, the king sent for his two counselors, Ruel the Midianite and Job the Uzite, to hear their advice. Ruel spoke, if it seemed good to the king, let him desist from the Hebrews. Let him not stretch his hand forth against them. For Yahuwah chooses them in days of old and took them as the lot of his inheritance among all the nations of the earth who is there that have dare stretch forth his hand against them with impunity that their God avenge the evil done unto them. Ruel then proceeded to enumerate some of the mighty things Yahuwah had performed for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he closed his admonition with the words, Verily, thy grandfather, the Pharaoh of former days, raised Joseph, the son of Jacob, above all the princes of Egypt, because he discerned his wisdom. For through his wisdom, he rescued all the inhabitants of the land from the famine, after which he invited Jacob and his sons to come down to Egypt that the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen be delivered from the famine through their virtues. Now, therefore, if it seem good in thy eyes, leave off from destroying the children of Israel. And if it be not that thy will dwell in Egypt, send them forth from here that they may go to the land of Canaan, the land where their ancestors sojourned. When Pharaoh heard the words of Jethro Ruel, he was exceedingly wroth with him and he was dismissed in disgrace from before the king, and he went to Midian. The king then spoke to Job and said, What sayest thou, Job, and what is thou advice respecting the Hebrews? Job replied, Behold, all the inhabitants of the land are in thy power, so let the king do as seemeth as good in his eyes. Balaam was the last to speak at the behest of the king and said, From all that the king may devise against the Hebrews, they will be delivered. If thou thinkest to diminish them by flaming fire, Thou will not prevail over them, for their God delivered Abraham, their father, from the furnace in which the Chaldeans cast him. Perhaps thou thinkest to destroy them with the sword, but their father Isaac was delivered from being slaughtered by the sword. And if thou thinkest to reduce them through hard and vigorous labor, thou will also not prevail. For their father Jacob served Laban in all manner of hard work, and yet he prospered. If it please the king, let him order all the male children that shall be born in Israel from this day forward to be thrown into the water. Thereby canst thou wipe out their name, for neither any of them nor their fathers was tried in this way. Is this the is this Ruel the same Moses' father-in-law? Um, Tiffany, it said what he was, the Midianite. Many probably is because Ruel was a Midianite. Moses went to Midian. It could be. I'm not sure yet. Remember, a lot of them had the same names. Could be, Tiffany. Not sure just yet. Okay. You know what? We'll go ahead to this little one section. Balaam's advice was accepted by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They knew that Yahuwah pays measure for measure. Therefore, they believed that the drowning of the men children would be the safest means of exterminating the Hebrews without incurring harm for themselves. For Yahuwah had sworn unto Noah never again to destroy the world by water. Thus, they assumed they would be exempt from punishment wherein they were wrong. However, in the first place, though Yahuwah had sworn not to bring a flood upon men, there was nothing in the way of bringing men into a flood. Boom. <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> Listen to that, y'all. Hold on. Listen. I'm going to read that again. In the first, hold on. Thus they assume they would be, ex hold on, let me, I just got to read. Let me go back. Okay. Balaam's advice was accepted by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They knew that Yahuwah pays measure for measure. Therefore, they believe that the drowning of the men would be the safest means by exterminating the Hebrews without incurring harm themselves. 
for Yahuwah had sworn unto Noah never again to destroy the world by water. Thus, they assumed they would be exempt from punishment wherein they were wrong. However, in the first place, Yahuwah had sworn not to bring a flood upon men. There was nothing in the way of bringing men into a flood. Furthermore, the oath of Yahuwah applied to the whole of mankind, not to a single nation. The end of the Egyptians was that, that they might meet their death in the billows of the Red Sea, measure for measure. As they had drowned the men children of the Israelites, so they were drowned. Pharaoh now took steps to looking to, to the, I'm sorry, Pharaoh now took steps looking to the faithful execution of his decree. He sent his bailiffs into the house of Israel to discover all newborn children, wherever they might be, to make sure that the Hebrews should not succeed in keeping the children hidden. The Egyptians hatched a devilish plan. Their women were to take their little ones to the houses of the Israelites, Israelitish women that were suspected of having infants. When the Egyptians began to cry or coo, the Hebrew child, the Hebrew children that were kept in hiding would join in after the manner of babies and betray their presence, whereupon the Egyptians would seize them and bear them off. Ain't that something? And that's some crap, right? Yeah, if y'all notice that that that's something that babies tend to do. Babies hear other babies, they're kind of like enamored with them. So one baby talking, all babies talking. One baby crying, all babies crying, right? Yeah, I know. I got a whole gaggle of kids. That that's true. Listen to this. Pharaoh now took steps to look into the faithful execution of his decree. He sent his bailiffs into the houses of the Israelites to discover all newborn children, wherever they might be, to make sure that the Hebrews would not succeed in keeping the children hidden. The Egyptians hatched a devilish plan. Their women were to take their little ones to the houses of the Israelitish women that were suspected of having infants. When the Egyptian children began to cry or coo, the Hebrew children that were kept in hiding would join in after the manner of babies and betray their presence, whereupon the Egyptians would seize them and bear them off. Dastardly. Furthermore, Pharaoh commanded that the Israelites women employ none but Egyptian midwives who were to secure precise information as to the time of their delivery and were to exercise great care and let no male child escape their vigilance alive. If there should be parents that evaded the command and preserved a newborn baby boy in secret, they and all belonging to them were to be killed. It is to be wondered at then that many of the Hebrews kept themselves away from their wives. Nevertheless, those who would put their trust in Yahuwah were not forsaken by him. Nevertheless, those who put their trust in Yahuwah were not forsaken by him. I'm going to read that one more time. Nevertheless, those who put their trust in Yahuwah were not forsaken by him. The women that remained united with their husbands would go out into the field when it was their time of delivery and give birth to their children and leave them there while they themselves returned home. Yahuwah, who had sworn unto their ancestors to multiply them, sent one of his angels to wash the babes, anoint them, stretch their limbs, and swathe them. Then he would give them two smooth pebbles, from one which they would suck milk, and from the other, honey. And Yahuwah caused the hair of the infants to grow down to their knees and serve them as a protecting garment. And then he ordered the earth to receive the babes, that they be sheltered therein until the time of their growing up, when it will open its mouth, mouth and vomit forth the children, and they will sprout up like the herb of the field and the grass of the forest. We haven't seen this in our day, but has this happened? I truly believe it did. Just because we didn't see it doesn't mean it didn't happen, right? Just because we can't see the air we breathe doesn't mean it's not there. We clearly know it's there because we're still alive, right? Okay, I just want to make sure y'all track with me. Okay, thereafter, each would return to his family and the house of his father. When the Egyptians saw this, I'm just trying to get everybody in the mindset of believing and believing y'all for some great miracles and expecting some great miracles to happen. 
to release you who is people from bondage, right? I'm just, I, I love to read this because it increases our faith. It stretches our minds, things that we didn't currently know that happened before we now know. It's like, wait, that happened? Yes, that happened before. Father, we're believing you for this. It gives us faith to believe you who are for more things, for bigger things. It strengthens us, right? So this is why it's good to get the full story, right? It is. It's so awesome, Trina. When the Egyptians saw this, they went forth, every man to his field with his yoke of oxen, and they plowed up the earth as one plows it at seed time. Yet they were unable to do harm to the infants of the children of Israel that had been swallowed up and lay in the bosom of the earth. Thus the people of Israel increased and waxed exceedingly, and Pharaoh ordered his officers to go to Goshen to look for the male babes of the children of Israel. And when they discovered one, they tore him from his mother's breast by force and thrust him into the river. But no one is so vigilant as to be able to fool Yahuwah's purposes, though he contrived 10,000 subtle devices unto that end. The child foretold by Pharaoh's dreams and by his astrologers was brought up and kept concealed from the king's spies. It came to pass after the following manner. And we are going to start that tomorrow as it now be gets into the gets into the portion where the deliverer himself was being raised in the king's very own household. You got your own judgment being raised by your own sister in your house, my G. Let me tell you, y'all is so amazing that he hides it right under your nose and you are you you are none the wiser, right? And you're helping our deliverer to learn about your ways, your scrupulous ways that we may understand how you act and you who gives you and downloads more information to you. Listen, this is how Pharaoh thinks. This was this was about to happen. This is what we're about to do, Moses. Let the people know. Get ready. Stand back. Watch how I do this. We're about to roll out. All right, y'all. So we're gonna pick this up tomorrow. And this was Legends of the Jews. We read um, from page 204 to page 208 is volume two, chapter four, the whole section about Moses. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to keep reading this all the way through. And today's chapters in uh, Exodus, we read the beginning three chapters, Exodus one, two, and three, y'all. So it is Wednesday, January the 6th, 2021, day 42 of year three. Of reading through the books of the law and the prophets and of the three year consecutive day count, day 712. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the reading for today. We're gonna go ahead and do the blessing and get out of here. Um, amen. Yes, yes, he does, Ali. Y'all, like a lot of people don't realize what's about to start happening here in this land, and I can see small little glimpses of it happening in different places, but we're going to start seeing a lot of it here in the United States of America. Like, seriously, as your fool's people are waking up, man, he about to pour out his spirit upon his people. I'm so excited about the coming days. I truly am. I truly, truly am, y'all. All right, y'all. So let's go ahead and do the blessing so you guys can get out of here. We got stuff to do today. All right. Remember, the blessing is found in Numbers chapter 6, from verses 22 through 27. Remember, the first 21 verses is the Nazarite vow, you guys. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless my children. You shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, May Yahuwah bless us and keep us. May Yahuwah make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon us and give us his peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. All right, beautiful people. That is it for today. Y'all welcome for the lesson. Y'all call it a lesson. I mean, I guess it could, but I'm just reading right from the book and the other scrolls that I have available to me. I guess it kind of can be called a lesson based on the stories I kind of add to it from my own personal experience. So I, I guess so. But I'm, I'm just reading to y'all just in case, you know, y'all need the, a study buddy, so to speak, somebody to read with you. But anyway, you're welcome. It is my pleasure. I enjoy doing this. Even if nobody ever showed up, I'd still be reading just in case somebody down the line, they're looking for it. They ain't got no Bible or whatever. It, it, I'd be doing this anyway. All right, y'all. 
I call it a blessing. Yes, and amen. I bless y'all. All right, y'all. That's it for today. I love y'all, and I'll see y'all bright and early in the morning, 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Peace.